I usually keep these introductions fairly short, but uh, I found the facts that Trevor Bell Chambers has given me were very profound, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to give him a, a short life history. Um, Trevor's been happily married to Lynn for 54 years and has two sons, educated at Gawler Primary, Thedford and Technical High School, Gawler High, Auto Park Teachers College and University of Adelaide. Trevor's worked at the uh, Education Department for 44 years, running small country schools for 42 of those 44 years. He's taught swimming and life-saving for 52 years at Gawler and other swimming pools. On his list that he gave me, I omitted the fact that uh, a few years ago, the Gawler swimming pool was actually called the Trevor Bell Chambers Swimming Pool. Yeah. Swimming pool. Um, Trevor's community service includes 10 years St John, 10 years Country Fire Service, 46 years School Council, 53 years as a Royal Life Saving Society examiner and instructor, 32 years as a Neighbourhood Watch Coordinator and 25 years as a JP. He's a founding member of the Barossa Principals Association. In, 19, in March 1984, he called a public meeting and founded the Gawler Veteran Vintage Classic Vehicle Club. He's passionate about this car club and collecting and preserving old vehicles. Don't ask him how many he's got in his shed. Trevor has served as president of that club for 10 years, vice president two years, editor for five years, secretary four years, events director for nine years. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special good day to some of the car club members that are here. It's always great to see you. I'll briefly explain why I'm a dedicated old car nut, and from my childhood through, you'll understand where I'm coming from. <coughs> my first motoring adventure was at three years of age. I started my grandfather's truck in the shed. Thankfully, it wasn't in gear. It would have gone through the shed and down into the dam. We had a 1943 Lendley's Ford that started beautifully, ran well, and I found that he can run very fast when he heard that motor go. But we also had Gawler's first truck was a 1917 International with solid wheels, and we had that on the farm as a sawbench. It still had its old ooh, 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 horn on the side, its gas lights and everything, so I drove that for hours each day as a little kid pretending I was driving. And uh, that lasted many, many years, that poor old thing. My grandparents, we lived out on the farm at Mount Crawford, my grandparents had a little Morris 840. The roads were so rough, we used to bounce all over the road. So my two ambitions in life when I was little was to get a little purple motor car and take the kids to school. Well, I've done it in every coloured car but purple. And to get a purple buckboard and put sand on the rough roads to make them smooth. But I didn't achieve either of those things really. So uh, my grandparents bought a, a Vanguard and that solved the problem. It's a nice heavy vehicle. The Gawlers had a great history of cars too. The oldest car ever in Gawlers is a 1904 Oldsmobile and belonged to William Antwis. And for your interest, that's a headlight from that car. Oh. It's also the taillight from that car. <laughs> and a pair of these, you lit them with a match. One sat each side and it was a little curved dash Oldsmobile with a tiller steering. I also had a 1904 Oldsmobile. Mine was a big super 10 horsepower single cylinder model. This was wow. a 5. Oh. And the next one was Dr. Fuchs with a 1905 um, to Dion. But there's a lot of very interesting old cars being in Gawler for always. The first ones to get taped to me were doctors because by the time you got the horse kick started, you could have the car down the road and uh, be well on your way to look after a patient. My first driving experience um, was a little Morris Pine Ute. I used to work for an old uncle for a dollar a day. <coughs> I thought I was worth it. And he had the, the hospital just over the road here, which was the uh, Churchill Private Hospital. I don't know if any of you remember it. Sister Powell's Hospital. Anyway, he had just over the Elway Bridge, all of that land running down the river was a dairy. He used to run cows there. Now and again, he'd get me to go and milk the cows. There were four I had to milk. And he'd say, look, go on to you, you'll be okay, around the back roads. And I was all 14, so I started driving fairly early around Gawler. And uh, I was driving everywhere, you know, within the next year or so. But uh, then my cousin bought a little Austin 7, a meteor body one, we had a lot of fun in that. Then he bought an L-type Magna MG. And that 
and the Morris Minor were very evenly matched, so we used to have a race around one block in Gawler. And around the railway corner there we'd go flat out around there, full drift, and I think that's the first road graffiti in Gawler, it was on that corner that we put there. And uh, <clears throat> he then bought an MGTC, which I restored while I was away for two years, and got to drive sparingly because my auntie was paying the bills. But my own experience, Dad wouldn't let me have an old car. He said, son, you're going to be a teacher. You can get a new car. So he probably thought all teachers were rich. Well, I've got news for him. But, uh, so I didn't get my first car until I was nearly uh, 20 and a half, and it was an AP5 Valley. Nice new one. Drove it out of York Motors around the corner and picked up my future wife and took her home. And that was my first adventure in a new car. I bought an old Riley, my first old car was a Riley, two and a half litre. I bought for $50 because the guy that owned it had tried it out on the nine mile straight at Malala and uh, it had dropped a timing gear and did a bit of damage. So I bought it off him for $50. But at that time I went for a rural youth exchange down to um, Bordertown and the guy that I was staying with had three Rileys, two for parts, one for driving. So he sent me all the parts I needed and I got that car on the road and we used it. And while I was at, we were going to be living at, when we were at the Long Plains School, Lynn was going to continue working in Adelaide because you could catch the train from Adelaide, but just before the wedding we are going to shift to Apple. My first school was Wombi up in the Mallee, still no car, I was 19 with 35 children. That was interesting because I only looked like a kid at 19, and I had 15 and 14 year old children who almost looked older than me, and they all thought, who's this kid that's going to teach our kids? Because again, without a car, Dad just dropped me off, good luck son, see you later. A bit like that when I went to high school. I went to Phoebe Tech. We used to call it the Barton and wear our ties like cravats after school to sort of stick it up in the private school. And uh, we said, they'd say, we've never heard of that school. So it's very exclusive. But um, it, it, was a, it was a fun place to go, but it taught me some practical skills. Fitting and turning, blacksmithing, sheet metal work and woodwork, which I now can use in my shed. From Wombi, I went to Beaufort, above Long Plains, and then from Beaufort to uh, Long Plains, uh, sorry, above, um, Beaufort was above uh, Port Wakefield, up on the road to Nantua, Long Plains, out at Malala, and then from there we got married, and we were going to stay in the house at Long Plains, but we ended up at Appler. And Lynn, being a city girl, was a bit of a culture shock, going to Appler, but she soon learned to drive the spotlighting rig and the fire the shot going quite well, so she did well for us. <laughs> When we formed the pistol club, she was a top lady pistol, sh pistol shooter in the mid-north, so I'm still a bit wary of her if she's armed. <laughs> but uh, um, when I got to Rosedale, uh, that was the only school I had a choice to go to. I stayed in the small schools by choice. I started school at five and I left at 61. There's a slow learner for you. But uh, it was always great. In the small schools, the children were quite different. And you could really work with them. And, um, it was very satisfying because a lot of them are now my friends on Facebook. A lot of them I've been proud to be able to do their weddings for them with my wedding cards. That's been really special. And I want to get some of them together soon because I've got the capsule that we put together in 2000 at the school. And uh, I'd like them to be a fair crowd when we open that up and check it out. So uh, when we're at Long Plain, uh, sorry, when we're at um, Rosedale School, we were living at Sherrod Log and some of the parents said, oh, you drive past our door, would you consider maybe picking up little Johnny on the way? Now, I had a two-door Monaro 307 manual at the time, you couldn't fit many in, I really didn't want to cram them all in there, so I bought a $50 Morris, $50 Morris Oxford. That became the first school bus. And we've had up to 14 in that on a rainy day with one in the boot with his bike. <laughs> we were cramming the record. And then I got a little uh, comma bus, and then after that we got an AP, uh, a uh, Ford XR, Wagon, uh, well not wagon, sorry, a, a sedan. So they were our school buses there, but I've always had this bit of a passion for cars. And when I was a kid, I didn't even have a push bike, which I can't understand why, because Dad was a bike rider. He used to ride 98 miles non-stop to see Mum. And so without a bike, I used to have to run from the woodwork lessons up in the manual down to Gawler Primary. The only one running, I'd arrive in a puffing heat two minutes late, and the teacher said, why are you late? So, I had to run. Where's your bike? Come and go on. Why? Dad won't let me have one. I went to high school traveling on the train every day, and he got me a bike. So how dumb was that? I didn't need it. But um, <clears throat> I got an interest in old cars and looking around. And when I was at Chio Glog, I started to gather a few bits and pieces. Or even when I was at Apple, we had a big yard there and I managed to find a couple of old model Ts. I found a 1904 Oldsmobile, which is extremely rare. I found some old motorbikes. I went over the west coast and uh, took a little bit of shooting on the station. And the second day, the 
Chappy took me up to uh, explore some of the other stations and talk to people, and we came back with a truckload of old motorbikes, including early Harleys and old Excelsior, the best part of Henderson, a lot of little AJs, lettuces, and things like that. A motorbike owner's dream. But later on, when I got two sons, my wife said, Look, really don't want the boys to go up riding bikes. Would you consider getting rid of the bikes and just stick to the cars? Now she's saying, I wish I'd said stamps or coins or something <laughs> a little less uh, large and back yet. Car clubs, I joined the Model T Club, of course, when I had a Model T, and I restored a little road so you'll see if I go directly. That's a nice car. And uh, we um, joined the Ryder Club, the Morgan Club, the Packard Club, and uh, the um, T Ford Club, the Jensen Club, because I had a Jensen one stage. But single make clubs can be a bit of a problem because if you go on a run, they're all the same. But they're boring. Then they start arguing who's best. I spend a bit more money on mine. Oh no, you know, I do this, that, and they get real picky, and I don't like that. That shouldn't be in a car club. The car club that I envisaged was one where we could have whatever we liked on there. We're not really into spit and polish and that sort of thing. We're into having fun and going on the road, taking our families, and just having some outings with friends. And I'm so delighted from this club because some of my best friends on the planet are involved in that club, and it's been a wonderful experience. With the car club, I um, thought, really, there's nothing locally here happening. Something should happen. So I started asking around. I found a few people with old cars, and a couple of them actually delivered Father Christmas to the school concert. We had one come up in a little Singer sports car, took Father Christmas away. Every year we tried to find some different way of Santa arriving at the school. He came on the back of motorbikes, in police cars, on fire engines, whatever we could find. One was even delivered in a little Zeta Sport. And the guy driving was about six foot eight, and he drove it in the hall through one door, dropped Santa Claus off, and drove out the other door. It was so small. So I thought, right, there's some old cars around. What is there to hold these people together? Then I started to see cars on trailers leaving Gorlin. I thought, hang on, this is right, they should be coming into Gorlin. But no, a lot leaving. In the final stores, one day I saw a Vetter Model T with brass lamps, oil lamps on the side, brass radiator, still with straw hanging off it, come around the corner by the, the stationery shop on the corner there, you know, the uh, office shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. I thought, this, this has come out of somewhere in the town, this has got to stop. So I talked around to people, I organised with Greg Harris the bus trips to Bendigo Swap Meet. And Greg, being an old car nut himself, loved the idea. So we got it together, advertised widely, we had our first one in 1982, we filled the bus easily. And so I had a captive audience. So I could talk to these people all the way over there and all the way back about possibly of something happening in the Gaul area. We did the same thing in 83, and we did the same thing for lots of years. But I gauged the interest, and then I called a couple of meetings at my place with people I knew had old cars, and did a little bit of groundwork and a bit of soul searching. Thought, no, we really think there should be a club in this school area. So on the, 4th, on the 20th of March, 1984, I called a meeting at Pellefort's Little Family Restaurant. 23 people turned up. They were representing 17 different clubs, and between them, they owned well over 120 collectible cars. And of those people that came, there are still uh, some of those members from that first meeting are still members of our club. So I'll just share with those because you'll know some of these. Um, we had um, Peter Bailey, Paul Barnett, John Batten, Trevor Bellchamers, Bob Carr, Alec Harris, Bill Harris, David Hoytzenroder, David Pettifor, Brian Sample, and Tony Trager. And they are currently still members of our car club. So they've been around now for nearly 38 years, so they're doing very well. But I'm glad I started when I was younger. Um, we started off our meetings at Pettifor's little restaurant, and it didn't take long before we sort of outgrew that. Then from Pettifor's restaurant, we went to the um, staff room in Gawler East Primary School, and that lasted for a while. We didn't grow very quickly at the start, um, but it was consolidated. We had our very first run out to, um, I think that was on the... Um, 15th of July 1984, we went out to Rosedale Primary School because I knew the principal of there rather well. And um, we had an observation run on the way, and there's a lot of um, father son competition, which was rather good fun. We had a barbecue lunch there and a get together, and I've got photos of that first run. And uh, a lot of those people are still involved here. And the Brian Samuel's son won the observation trial, and my son and I have got second prize in it. But there were a lot of you that got prizes down the line, and that was a fun thing to do. Our very first static display was at the Gawler Show that year in 84, and that was on the 25th of August. And we 
we've got photos again of the cars going down past the, uh, down this road here, um, down to the oval, and that was our first static display. We decided to try for a swap meet. So on the 9th of September that year, we had a swap meet on the Gawler Racecourse in the enclosed area. We catered it for, uh, David did the catering, he had a catering van, we had a fashion show, we had a lot of things happening. And that really put us on the map because a lot of people came to that show. We charged a whole dollar to get in. I think if you wanted to decide it was about three dollars. It's slightly more now. But it has grown to be the biggest swap meet in South Australia. And uh, we're rather proud of that fact. The first year we made some money <coughs> and we paid to build the helipad at the New Gawler Hospital. And then some goose decided that they could let houses grow by and couldn't bring the helicopters in anymore. So that was a waste. The second year, our money went to establish the recovery gardens up there. So we were orientated towards doing, in assistance with, or in hand in hand with the local service clubs, local community projects. And then for many, many years, every year we'd have the thing that funds kept growing, but we would keep $400, which was what we allowed before tax. The rest, we take away expenses, and the rest were shared amongst the um, service clubs who helped us out by doing the catering, and we would help with parking and a few other things. So I estimate we probably put $300,000 plus into the community through the, the car club at this stage. The last few years we've had a project thing, hang on, we're a nice big club now, we really need a place of our own. So we're hoping sometime soon to have some land we can put our own buildings that on and have someone we can call, this is our special patch, develop a library, photos, everything else, and just have some place that um, we, we can call our own. From the Gawler, from the Gawler Primary School, uh, Gawler's Primary School rooms, we then went to the hall, High Street Hall, and we soon outgrew that because we were in a growth spurt, and from there we came here, and we outgrew this place, and so we went down to the, to the uh, big uh, youth shack, that great big room down there, and that's where we still are. And we have meetings on the third Tuesday each month, and uh, with COVID we've been catching for up to about 120 people, the chairs well spaced and everything else happening, but the club has grown to well over 700, plus 45 juniors. At the last count of month, a bit ago, it was 711, and we've had a meeting since then. I know it's grown since then. So it's a growing club. It's a very active club. We're probably one of the most active clubs in the state because we're always doing things. And uh, one of the uh, things that we like to do, of course, is our swap meet. And a lot of organisation goes to that because we do get people coming from interstate and everywhere. We're also organising a car show coming up shortly that will be uh, out at the Gales Winery. We also are running a veteran and vintage rally in the Brossa. That's for cars 19, 30 and earlier. And this one will be, it's on the 11th of April and this will be our sixth such rally. And uh, it's great to see the old cars out and about. To me, they're the crown jewels of car collecting. Last time we had some cars, 1904, five. We had a 199 steamer, a standing steamer, like a little, uh, I suppose, like a, it's like a car with an extra row seat. And it had a great big horn on it like a dragon. And every time it blew the horn, steam come hissing out of its mouth and it made a noise just like a steam engine coming. Wonderful thing to see it. And, uh, but there's some great cars. We attract people from all over. We had one from interstate this time. We've had a few when they would normally come over before COVID. And last time we had one who came down from Alice Springs and he'd been to WA as well. He came along and was part of our rally. A couple of the other clubs are now planning to do it as a national rally. So they'll be here while that's on. Um, you've all heard of the Bay of Birdwood. During the Bay of Birdwood time, the week before and the week after, it's normally been motorfest events. And clubs do host on those days. The Gawler Car Club has usually hosted one of the days. We've got one again this year. We're hosting on the Wednesday before Bay of Birdwood. And we're starting off at the headquarters in Adelaide, going to Richmond's in Adelaide to look at all the exotic cars, morning tea there, then come up the new Gawler highway to Gawler and then looking at some collections around Gawler and also noting the history of Gawler and giving them the opportunity to look at some of the very historical buildings and things around Gawler. So it should be a great day. And we have it open and we don't set a limit on how many can come and usually it's the biggest event at the Motorfest because a lot of people love to come and look around and uh, just enjoy what we show them. The, um, we always all go to the special days like All British Day all those British cars will head off to that, and uh, that's a great event, and it's a real atmosphere there, very much so. People with American cars, of course, go to the All-American Day, you've got the French Day, you've got the German Day, you've got a whole lot of special days for cars, and then you get some white mate days. Or companies like, there'll be a GM Day, and there'll be maybe a Chef Day, and some other like this, so 
We've got a lot of members from a lot of different cars, which makes it very interesting. We've got 44 MGBs, which is good, so we have an MGB run. And the MGBs leave that anyone else can come, but they follow the MGBs. And it was quite funny recently, they're going up through the hills and uh, they met the MGB club coming the other way with three cars. We had about 30 odd cars going that way, the MGs, they probably thought, where the devil do all these MGs come from? And when anyone else joins and they say they've got an MGB, they're welcome because we think that's rather great. We've got a monopoly on them almost. But you think of a car name, we've probably got it. I know we've got almost 700 cars on the club registration. Club registration is a wonderful thing, and South Australia pretty well led in that. I mean, that as a member of a club, you can get a registration which doesn't cost you a lot, and it gives you 90 days use of your car. And so you can just fill in, today I'm going to, so your Barossa area, date it, sign it, and my car is registered and insured for the day on that one. If I go without filling that in and the police pull me over, I can then be charged for unregistered vehicle, etc., which I don't want to happen, and everyone's very careful to sign their logbooks in fact we remind them. But you can have lots of them. You have lots of cars on logbooks. I've got eight so far, but I'm not stopping there. I've got another friend of 32, and he's still going because he just bought one of mine. But um, it's the difference is when I was running the wedding cars, they would cost me about five and a half thousand dollars a year to register for them. Now they cost me around about three hundred and sixty dollars, and I've got one to use every day of the year. So I've got uh, three hundred and sixty days of. Uh, driving with those four cars if I want to. But it's just nice to know that you can have more than one car and can afford to because of the registration. Also the insurance, if you're a club member, of course, there's uh, um, cheaper insurance for you. Most of us go through Shannon's and they look after us and uh, we've found them very good. I have in the past. If you have a problem, they're there to help you for sure. And uh, they make it very, very reasonable. Like, uh, I've got my old 1958 Rolls Royce. And for that fully comprehensive for years, around about $200, which is not too bad for a, an old car like that to have that value. Um, a lot of our members also take part in many of the motoring events in South Australia. We have the Adelaide Targa, Adelaide Classic, we have the Tarmac Rally, the, the Scouts Rally, the Light Force Inland Rallies, and a lot of our members have, in fact we had a club team that was led by Trevor, our current president, and, that, and I was a member of that for a while, and I've been the starter a lot of those events for probably the last five years or so. It's good fun, and uh, there's a real, and South Australia is really a centre for motoring everywhere. Everyone envies the classic car we have, the variety of cars we have, and the fact we get out and use them, we've got the best climate to be able to do that. I've got a lot of friends that I currently correspond with in Europe, who are up to the own walls in snow for half the year, and said, we should immigrate to Australia, it sounds like a pretty good place, we can go for a drive whenever, we can't do that here. Um, the static displays, if there's like the uh, village fair, we used to often have static displays there. Years ago, some of you may remember when we had the street parties in Gorlin, mm. and we used to always have a car display there. And, uh, and then a lot of the towns nearby have little Christmas runs, and so we're able to um, take part in those Christmas um, parades and static displays just to help them out with the numbers. But we have three runs a month which is an awful lot. Some clubs have about one in run every two months. The first Sunday in the month is our Sparrow Run. That's its polite name. We get up and leave early so you can guess what its real name is. And uh, we go for a drive and have breakfast and tends to bring out all the early risers, some really nice sports cars and they come along and enjoy the drive off and through the hills. And we go and have a nice breakfast together and then we'll sort of go and look at something else if you want to or head home if you want to. We meet on the third Tuesday and on the third Wednesday we're having runs on the third Wednesday for those who are retired, are available or just waiting in the day, can come along and enjoy themselves and a bit of fellowship with that. Plus we have a Sunday run as well, so there's plenty of variety. We try and make it family orientated, so there's something there to interest everyone. The ladies aren't going to be bored silly by looking at cars all the time. We do try and look at things that um, would grab their interest. The club organised a trip to Tasmania some years ago and I'm delighted that I was part of it. We set the itinerary, the, the company we used set the, the combination and the transport. And we saw so much because everybody got together and picked what they wanted to see. Someone wanted to see a doll museum, someone wanted to see pottery, someone wanted to see um, crocheting or um, making rugs or whatever. The guys of course wanted to see cars and things, but there was something for everybody. And I think that's what makes our club tick so well because we share a lot of different interests. And, uh, 
we're not just all tied into one lake. You know, we, we've got wider vision than that. Some people think, you know, that's a whole lot. That's the only car on earth. No, sorry. Um, or if you've got a Jaguar, you know, you've made it. No, you haven't. They get a lot of trouble in the leak oil. And uh, but uh, it, it it just the one thing I like when you go anywhere, and if you've got an old car and you meet another old car nut, you've got an immediate friendship. And I found that also in Thailand doing some business. I was talking to a guy who was the executive director of Pansium International. And I thought, I'm getting nowhere with this guy, so I phoned up my wife and family, pulled out the drawer, his wife and family. My house, his house. One of my old cars, his old car. Straight away, every barrier melted, and I was his best mate. He had a 1964 Cadillac, he carted me all over Bangkok in it, and because there's no insurance there, it was like royalty, we had 100 yards in front and behind. This guy was about that tall standing on a drum. His car was costing 10,000 baht a year to register, his normal car was 600, that was his golf car. But he just loved the idea that we had, uh, I had old cars. Because that seemed to put me in a bracket of friendship above, um, and I was a stranger to him, but straight away there was a warmth there, and a greeting, and a, an acceptance. We did the same thing recently on a holiday and went into uh, Longreach. And I was trying, being an old car nut, I try and find the old car people in the town. I'd love to have a chat with them. I also collect number plates, that's a good way of finding stuff like that. Anyway, we talked to a couple of police personnel while we were having coffee, and they said, Yeah, we've got a, we've got a club, I'm a member. Go down to the police station and ask for Keith. So I thought, Alright, so we wandered down the police station and looked us up and down and said, Yes, can we help you? Rather suspicious. And he said, Do you keep a Keith here? He said, Yeah, we keep him down the back. So they called him in, come up, he's a head copper for the whole area, but a lovely man. He said, no, come down the cafeteria, we had to chat, and I always take a couple of books of things, and he became a very good friend and opened up the whole town to us. We went to a concert with him, we did everything there in town, and we want to go back because we made a lot of friends there. But the interest in cars certainly cements the friendship. And you can go anywhere, and if you've got a, a, a hobby that uh, you're in really uh, dedicated to whatever, you find like-minded people, and you are very, very welcome. And old cars are one of the most universal things you can collect. You go anywhere in the world and find someone with an old car and you've got a friend. Even if you're out in the bush and you break down, you always find old car people coming to your rescue. And I've got a list of the names of a lot of country towns. In fact, my friend thinks I know everyone in Australia. The ones I don't know, the few of them they know me. And one day we drove from Lake Entrance all the way up over the hills from Romeo down into Bright. <coughs> we pulled up the main street of Bright. He pulled up, I pulled up, both got out. First guy come along and said, oh, g'day Trevor, what are you doing here? <laughs> this poor guy was ready to bang his head on the bonnet. We went to New Zealand and uh, we had that, again there were 12 of us from the car club on the bus trip. I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone about cars and things in the North Island, but at the South Island we were down at um, Blenheim. And I thought, no, hang on, I've got to talk to someone anyway. I made a couple of phone calls and the lady at the desk made a couple of phone calls. And Two cars arrived to pick up the fellas after dinner and car loads to show some sheds and things. And I started talking about maybe the idea of a sister club. And when I continued that after we came back and they were delighted to become a sister club with our club because we had the same values, the same sort of interest and the same wide range of cars. In fact, two of the bus loads and visited us some years ago here and said, why didn't we come for a week? They came for a day on a tour. And we popped them in old cars and took them all around the valley and everywhere else. And they had a ball, so you know, any time any of us go to New Zealand, we're most welcome to go and see Marlborough chapter of the Vintage Car Club of um, New Zealand, and they will make you most, most welcome. The one I was able to get going in Poland was a bit interesting, was having old car, uh, wedding cars. Uh, a girl from Poland married a boy from Gaul, and he's a singer <coughs> and lives in Sydney at the moment. Mum and Dad in Poland have got a magnificent great house, more like a castle, and they've also got a car museum. And it includes military vehicles and everything. A fabulous car museum. And so they uh, said, look, uh, they came in the next day and spent quite a bit of time with Linda looking at the bits and things I had, the cars and things. And I gave him some number plates for each state of Australia plus Canberra for his museum. And each time he comes back, he brings me some European ones. He brought me back a nice Polish treble one he had made up for me. So. That starts my collection, my, my Euro wall in the shed. But he said, look, you must come over and stay with us because we often do summer trips, say, from Paris to, uh, to uh, Moscow. If you're over there with us, we'll give you a car. You can go on the run with us. He thought, is that ever trying to climb out of my back with this? But there's a bit of resistance I'm finding, and also COVID doesn't have a moment. I'd love to go there and just do that. That would be great fun. 
again, people have got that interest all over the world, and the Polish people were very put it to the Polish people when he got back then. They were very, very pleased and proud to be assistant club with us internationally. And then CAAR Polski, but there, there are eight CAAR car clubs all through Europe that are affiliated. So we're actually affiliated with most of Europe with our little Gawler car club. Plus I send newsletters to New Zealand and uh, Darwin, Alice Springs, Man uh, Broken Hill and Poland of course. And uh, that just keeps that relationship going nicely. But I would love to go one day and visit some of these places for sure. We have a club magazine which we put out by monthly, the journal, and the, the feature on there is Lorraine and her husband with their cars on the front of that one. And it's uh, a very well produced magazine that one of our ladies now does as our editor. The front covers are all done by Paul Barnett, still going strong as an original member of our club. And, uh, but the um, other things, we have a, an annual dinner, and we only have two trophies, and that's the President's Trophy for Service, and then we have a Bad Luck Trophy. Nobody wants to win that one. And so they find someone has had a bit of a problem and uh, whether it's, yeah, the worst problem of the year ends up with that trophy. A couple have won it twice. I won it once. I don't want to win it again. <laughs> and then you get a little, next year you get a nice little momento to remind you that you had that bad luck and there's your trophy. That's the one you keep. Yellow and hands on to some other poor side that had some trouble with his car. But um, it, it, it's, it's been a lot of fun and it's still an ongoing thing. You know, I'm, I'm a bit passionate about my cars. That's a little T4 that I rebuilt. Lean on the boys in the back, and the boot pops off, and it's sitting in the back and waved to everybody. And when I, I took a fellow for a ride, and he begged me to sell it to him, and when I told Lynn, she begged me to sell it to him as well. <laughs> so it went to the Western Channel and Channel. That little car's been in national rallies since then, all over Australia. And on that one, I used to learn on did everything but the chrome work the motor, the upholstery, the bodywork, the painting, I had to build the whole back in for it. Did down in Bob Arn's shed one night because I was living in the share block. He came in the night to see what I was up to and when he saw the compound curves and then I done, he said, how the devil did you do that? We can't do that with it. I learned she metal it. Before and after, that Packard's a Gore car it was over the overway bridge, some of you may remember it. I went to see the guy and said, look, do you mind if I cover it to protect it uh, because I'm a bit frightened it might rot and whatever. Also, I didn't want anyone else to see it. And I eventually bought it from him. Paid a whole $400 for it. So, but it's what says Google now, I've got the rest of it. And that's a finished one. So, that's an SS 1937. There's one of the papers that I was telling you before, one of the photos in the Bunyip area or in Gawler, the history of cars parked opposite the Bunyip down the road. The third one down is one of those. That's home in my shed. I've got two of those, and they're very, very rare. But SS is pre war Jaguar. They changed the name because SS wasn't real popular after the war, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. And it stood for um, Standard Swallow. That's a Mark IV Jaguar that we restored as a family, as just from bits and pieces. We restored that one and we took it in the 1982 Beta Burden, our first run in it, and we were so proud because it was our car. And it did look pretty good. I ended up swapping it for a white Rolls Royce down the track, but I've uh, still got a few more of those. That's another, that's before and after of those two. You don't need much to build a car, just a lot of resolve, big bag of money, big bag of time, big bag of patience. First run, ready to go to uh, Rosedale School. That old T4 truck is still in the club, that's David Penforce. That Holden unfortunately went to Tasmania with its owner, Brian Harrison, but there's still a few of the cars. This is on the way down to the show. And they were going down there to uh, be on the first display at the Gawler Show in 1984. That's the line of the cars at Rosedale School on the first run. It's nice, you know, for a beginning club, there's some really top cars here. That in type's still around, Dr. Thorne owns it now. And uh, there's some of the bigger cars. The rain has got this big one here, I've got that one. Um, that one's currently for sale if anyone wants a big one. It had an interesting number plate, PIMP01. <laughs> so his wife didn't like that very much, so he had to get rid of that plate. That's our president's car, Chrysler, that goes everywhere. It's another Dodge. The old canvas toppers are the ones that go on that special vintage and veteran run. And to me, they are the crown jewels of any collection. And in South Australia, because we didn't have an early manufacturer, we were home, we were open to the world. 
and a lot of them, the guys out in the stations that had lots of money needed to buy a big car that would last well, and so they bought Packards and La uh, um, yeah, LaSalle's and Cadillacs and uh, Hispanos Weezers and uh, all of that exotic stuff that's still here, which is rather great. That's a lovely old Oldsmobile sedan. 28 Chevy Tourist. Some of you might recognise some of these type of cars if your grandfather had one. I'm not going to suggest you had one. They're not that old. It's not a right old Ford. That's when, later when the T changed the ammo, that's when Lizzie became a lady. So different. Model T Fords are interesting. If you've never driven one, they're scary. I drove the first one along North Terrace and I wouldn't do it at the point now. Honestly, it was pretty scary things. That's another Oldsmobile Tourist. We've got an A-model tour in the club that a lady drives everywhere. She's been to Tasmania, she's been all over Australia, and she just drives it everywhere. So reliable, beautiful old thing. And uh, that's Graham Page. That, the chap who owns that's had it since he was 16. Mm. So now he's 70 odd. So he's had it quite a while, a little Chevy. But if any of you go up to the school on the 11th of April, to the um, Look, Luth and scroll up the hill about nine in the morning, you'll see a lot of these cars there. It's really spectacular. And they also do it, the school does some great breakfast as well. So it's uh, well worth going on and having a little room. That's just advertising our brochure. We've got a brochure we give out now to people and it saves a lot of talking. When you meet someone in the garage or somewhere, um, it's just handy to give them a, a brochure and say, look, this is what we're on about. Please come and uh, inspect. So the um, I'm glad the club's an ongoing club, it's growing, it's streamlining, increasing the number of activities, um, in creating a lot of interest for everybody that comes in. We're slowly getting a younger group coming through, which is great. So, uh, you know, we're not all real old funny days in the club now, we've got a few younger ones, and that's really good, because that's the future of the club. With 45 young kids, well, hey, that's looking good, because they're all enthusiastic and come along in the club runs as well. That's our badge originally. Got half a car wheel, half a motorbike wheel, the GBV CBC, and the town crest in the centre. And that was our original badge. I'd like to finish with this little poem, if I may. And this to me sums it up. Restore that wreck. That rusty tin, just junk or real treasure. Fight for the dump or a source of pleasure. Look at the dents, the holes, the rust that wreck of a vehicle that owners have cussed. You, you view the remains and thoughts cross your mind. Was this old car common or one of a kind? Pride of a family with kids in the back as it clattered along many a rough country track. The question is, to restore or just discard? Time, money, spare parts? The answer's hard. You see yourself driving and rallying this car and start looking for parts, both near and far. Car restores and enthusiasts really abound. There's even a club in your own hometown. Three years of work, cost, jibes, frustration and hope. A few times when you thought you couldn't cope. At last it's complete, comes the day. Now worth the time and money I had to pay. We proudly set off, wife in the front, kids in the back, with car club friends on a smooth, modern track. So I just thought that epitomised what we're on about. Thank you. Surely questions. <laughs> questions? Yes. Trevor, um, you mentioned Paul Barnett. Yes. Um, where did the, the hearse for John Barnett come from? What model was it? What make was it? Oh, I don't know. Studebaker or Bean? Bean. 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 Bean was the Gawler car originally. It's been purchased by the funeral director up here. George McLean used to own it. He used to go up the Main Street of Gawler with him walking in front with a hat on the chest, get up the top by where the lane lines were, it would stop, he'd hop on board and then putter out to the Williamstown, to the Williston Cemetery. I had the chance to buy that car back, but the fellow decided no at the last minute some years ago, I wanted to get it for the town. But it has come up in full weeks of bought it. So they've got that old one. There was another one years ago, we were at Apple, and I found a beautiful old um, studio back hearse that had been the hearse for Laura and the guy there who was manager of the ice cream factory and driving it around, all the locals were getting into it a bit saying, look, Grandpa went to his last rest and I think it's a little bit off that you're driving this thing around. So I said, you want to buy it for $400? So I went home and said, Lynn, I've got this beautiful old studio boat I can get for $400. She said, well, that seems pretty good. And I said, it goes too. Then she asked what body style. 
when I said, hey, she really turned up a bit, I said, look, people need to I'd never ride this thing for years. <laughs> but it didn't work, I didn't get it, but I wish I had it. Other questions? Yes. I used to live in Clare, right? Yeah, I live, I live in Newtown. Oh, wow. Stand up. Anyway, anyway my neighbour, my neighbour, I don't know if you know his name, was Ferg Mar. He was the president of the Clare Car Club. Yes. You know him, do you? Uh, probably because I knew the Tilbricks and everyone, everyone else. We didn't have much in the way of cars then. I had a few things in the old school shed at Hilltown. Oh, yeah. But it was when I left then and came down to Rosedale, I had a bit more space that I could do something. But no, I, I knew the uh, Tilbrooks and some of the others there with the old... In fact, I went with him the first day, got bits and pieces for his motor buggy. We could retrieve them right down the bottom end of the peninsula near the tow. Two wheels, half a motor and a few bits. And he built the motor buggy, international motor buggy out there. It's just that when Brian approached me at the start of the meeting, he asked me if I was interested in cars, and I said, not really. However, through Ferg, I did become interested because he restored some beautiful cars. Yeah, yeah. And he did a very good job of me, like you did. He had the same passion. That's Thank a great you. passion to have. Keeps me home, unless I'm out looking for cars. The last one I found is actually a 1943 Blitz, and I'm bringing that home because it was a wartime. It's only a little short wheelbase, one 1500 weight one, and under the bonnet it's got the um, War Department, um, Chev, three quarter ton, and I really want one because when I was a, a kid in Black Sunday, I was surrounded by fire and we were to die, but the Blitz rescued us, so I feel like I was Blitz alive because one saved me on that day, and we, we it was. Terrible, really. We were terrified because the chooks just fell over where they walked. Rabbits died in their arms. It was so hot and so oppressive and so smoky. You couldn't see a darn thing. And then two little lights come out of the gloom and it was an old blitz. They said, right, we had an old A40 ute. Hop in the back, cover yourself with, with woolen blankets. And we drove out through the fire with the front almost underneath the old blitz. Mm. That saved us that day. Because the house and everything was lost. Mm. So I, thought, mm, I feel indebted. Any other questions? I've got lots of answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll now ask Mick Cozio to give the vote of thanks, please. Okay, on behalf of the audience, I'd like to thank Trev for you know, this interesting uh, address. And it's pretty clear to me that this guy is passionate about what he does. And it's always great, even though it's not my interest, it's always great to see someone like this who is so interested in what he does I reckon it's going to keep him occupied for the rest of his life. Absolutely. And uh, it's good to see that. And, and once again, I'd like to thank him on behalf of you all for the address. It was brilliant. Thanks kindly. And thanks to you. And the, the audience would like you to have a small gift. That's very kind. Don't, don't mind, but it's not necessary. Well, oh, wow. According to mine, this is necessary. Okay. Uh, well done, Chris. Well done. Uh, I'd rather wear it than rust. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Trevor. That was wonderful. And thank, thank you, Mick, for uh, giving the vote of thanks. Just before I go, I've got to thank uh, Brian for all the efforts he puts into this industry club. It's brilliant. He puts a lot of effort in it. I reckon it's a passion of his too. It's good to see. Funny about that. <laughs>